All right. Uh, take your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. As we observe the Lord's Supper together today, I'm going to preach a message that I've preached before. I think this is one of those messages that we need to bring around regularly to remind us of what the Lord's Supper is. And I've entitled it, What is the Lord's Supper? This is the 411 on the Lord's Supper. There are two ordinances that Jesus gave to us as a New Testament church. And if you hear, what are the two ordinances of the church? That is a given question for anybody who's going to be ordained in a Baptist church. Then the two ordinances are what? Say it if you know it. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. These are two things ordained for us to do by Jesus. Both of them are living reminders and testimonies of the death and burial of Christ with faith in his resurrection and looking forward to the return of our Lord. Now, as it relates to the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, why did Jesus institute it? Institute it and why does he call us as a church to do it regularly? Maybe you're new to our church, or maybe you've been here a while, and there's some questions. Maybe you come from a different theological background. I want to walk with you through Scripture today to explain to you exactly what I believe and what Scripture teaches and what our church teaches about this ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And let's begin by looking here in the Bible at the evening before Christ's death and resurrection when he established it. Do you remember the chronology that it was actually the evening before which was Passover and it was there that Jesus took that last Passover celebration. We're going to talk about what Passover is in just a moment. And he reinterpreted it as the Lord's Supper in light of his impending death, burial, and then subsequent resurrection. And we see this in Matthew 26 and other places. Verse 26, we'll be looking at the Luke reference as well, a little later as well. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat it. This is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, when he says all of you, he's talking about the 11 disciples here. They were gathered in the upper room. If you were to go to Jerusalem today and you had a tour guide, most likely they would take you to a site there that's an upper room that actually looks like a medieval room. It's not actually, obviously, the room that Jesus gathered with his disciples, but tradition has it that it's on that site, that location there. In the Holy Land, after all of these years, 2,000 years since Christ, there's been churches and buildings built on top of buildings. And when you find those layers, that's a big indication of whether the tradition of that site may be accurate because uh, that, that tradition all the way back, some of these sites all the way back, almost to Jesus himself, where they were commemorating the events that happened there. But it was the 11 disciples. Remember what happened to the 12th? Judas, he had already left at this point, and he went to launch the events uh, that would uh, lead to his betrayal and then subsequently the crucifixion of Christ. Jesus says, but I tell you, I will not drink from this, notice the phrase here literally, fruit of the vine. Fruit of the vine. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. That's literally what the text says. Not oinos, translated wine, uh, but fruit of the vine. From now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and if they left from where the traditional site at this day is, then we're probably talking about a half a mile that they would walk right down uh, Mount Moriah, between Mount Moriah and Mount Zion to the Kidron Valley, and then right up to an area where there's a church to this day, the Garden of Gethsemane. 
And that's where Jesus began to pray. And you remember the story. It was there in the garden where the betrayal happened. Now, there's five things that I want to walk through very quickly with you. So we're going to do a crash course on the Lord's Supper, all right? We're going to talk about the history of the Lord's Supper. We're going to talk about the purposes of the Lord's Supper, the elements of the Lord's Supper, the regularity, how often should we be doing it, and then number five is the preparation for the Lord's Supper. How do we prepare ourselves to partake of the Lord's Supper rightly? So let's begin with the history of the Lord's Supper. As we have just read, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper on the evening before the crucifixion, and this was the time of the Passover. I believe that God sovereignly ordained at this moment because in Jesus' ministry, when some of his detractors and those came, that were coming against him were trying to get at him, he said, the Son of Man's hour has not come. And he slipped away. There were a couple of times that even commentators think there was a supernatural disappearance of the Lord because God had sovereign timing for when he wanted this to happen so that the sacrifice of Christ would be according to his chronology and not the Pharisees' chronology. And yet, right before the Passover, Jesus told his disciples, my time has come. Now is the time. And if you remember it, it was then that he got on the little coat on the other side of the Mount of Olives, most likely around the cities of Bethany and Bethpage. And he rode probably a mile and a half over into the city of Jerusalem. Remember, that's what we celebrate on Palm Sunday where people laid down the palms, uh, fronds, and said, uh, Hosanna to the King of Kings. And that's what we celebrate. And then that inaugurated the beginning there of what then became the Passover celebration that year before Christ's crucifixion. And the Passover itself was inaugurated 1,500 years earlier, and I believe it pointed exactly to what happened at the cross, and that's why God, I believe, wanted it to happen on Passover. The Passover, also called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, was the most important Hebrew feast and it commemorated the deliverance of the Hebrews from Egyptian bondage, Egyptian captivity. It's still, as you know, being celebrated to this day. 1,500 years before Jesus' birth, the Israelites were in Egypt and they were in slavery. And God called a man by the name of Moses to go to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and tell him, let my people go. And if you remember the story in Exodus, uh, Pharaoh would not listen. He hardened him, his heart. And so God subsequently sent 10 plagues to get Pharaoh's attention so that he would finally relent and release the Israelites so that they could return to the homeland, the promised land, the land we know today as Israel. And the 10th plague, the last one, was the event that then be, began to be commemorated every year as the Passover festival. God told the Israelites, he says, I want you to sacrifice a lamb and take their blood and, and, and paint the blood over your doorpost. And that evening that that was supposed to happen, God's angel would travel out over the region. And wherever he saw a doorpost with the blood of the lamb over it, he would pass over those houses. But the houses that did not have the blood over the doorpost, whether it was Egyptian or Israelite, then that death angel would take the firstborn from that household. And that's exactly what happened. And if you remember that there was crying and there was pain and there was grief in the land after that happened. And that's when Pharaoh finally relented and allowed God's people to be released. Now later he changed his mind. He paid a hefty price for it. But in Exodus chapter 12 verse 14, listen to what God said to the Israelites. He said, this day is to be a memorial for you and you must celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. You are to celebrate it throughout your generations as a permanent statute. 
And so that's why it's being celebrated to this day among the Jewish people. During the New Testament times of Jesus' day, large crowds gathered in Jerusalem to observe this annual celebration. In fact, I've heard some archaeologists and, and commentators say that the normal population of Jerusalem, which was a large city for Israel at that time, was approximately fifteen to 20,000. But during the Passover festival, it would swell to upwards of a quarter of a million people. And if you've ever been in that little area there, the old city of Jerusalem, which is, uh, there's some history there. That's not actually the oldest part of the city, but it's less than a mile square. And so people would crowd into this area and they were out in the, in the uh, lands around the city of Jerusalem because there were thousands and thousands of people who gathered for the Passover festival in fulfillment of God's command here that this was to be an annual celebration. Jesus and his disciples ate this Passover meal together on the eve before his death. In Luke chapter 22, listen in verse 15 to what happens there. Then Jesus said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. In other words, this is the last one we're going to celebrate together. We've been together for three years of my ministry. We actually see in the gospel of John, it's almost like Jesus' ministry is bookended by the Passover celebrations there and when he would be coming to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. But he's telling his disciples, this is the last one before my death and before my resurrection. So the Passover was an identification of the old covenant, whereas, get this, the Lord's Supper is an illustration of the new covenant which we currently have with Jesus. When Jesus reinterpreted the Passover, there's no longer a lamb needed, right? Even though at the Passover there was a lamb sacrificed every year, well, why is with the Lord's Supper, the reinterpretation by Jesus of the Passover, is there not a lamb? Because it is Jesus saying, I am the fulfillment of the promise. I am the fulfillment of what the Passover has been teaching you for 1,500 years. And by the way, John the Baptist told you this. He said, behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world, which he said that at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Now we're at the end of Jesus' ministry, and he's bringing it all together for him and saying, I am the Lamb. I am the Lamb. The first Lord's Supper was Jesus' reinterpretation of the Passover in light of his impending crucifixion and resurrection. And as we said, he was in essence making it absolutely clear that he was the Lamb of God. The Lord's Supper then is, in a way of speaking, the Christian Passover. It is a regular reminder of the cost for our sins. Paid by Christ in order that we might be saved, be born again. We'll see in just a moment the Lord's Supper doesn't save you. It is a reminder of your previous salvation and the call to recommitment in your life. Now from time to time I see churches and Christians and I've even been a part of a Passover Seder which is being a part of a contemporary Passover uh, uh, evening and uh, you might say, is that okay to do? I think that it is. I think that seeing the history there and seeing how Christ fulfills that is, is, is okay. But don't substitute the Lord's Supper for it. All right? The Lord's Supper is our Passover celebration uh, with Jesus. And so that's a brief history. Number two, the purposes of the Lord's Supper. The purposes of the Lord's Supper. I believe there's two reasons that we have the Lord's Supper primarily, and that is to remember and to recommit. I believe we need both of these. Luke chapter 22, verse 19, Jesus says, or it says, And when Jesus had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in 
remembrance. There we go. In remembrance of me. We regularly remember what Christ did for us 2,000 years ago. Jesus instituted it because he knew that in the hustle and bustle of life, it would be easy for us to lose our focus on the primary commitment that we have and to allow the cares of this world at times to distract us. But by having the Lord's Supper regularly, we're coming back to what the Lamb of God did for us 2,000 years ago to remind us, remind us that all of life is about the salvation that Jesus gave us in helping other people find a relationship with Jesus Christ. We are to remember. But I want you to also see that it is a time of recommitting. I cannot imagine that we would look back 2,000 years ago and remind ourselves, as we will today and as we are today, now we do this really every Sunday, but especially especially when we take the Lord's Supper and take the elements that represent the body and blood of Christ. And we remember, but how can you do that? How can you look back at the broken body of Christ and the blood that was shed without being called to recommit your life to Jesus? I believe in that sense, it is a regular renewal of our spiritual vows with the Lord. And I hope today that every person that claims the name of Christ will leave today more committed to Jesus than when you came in here. Because what we're doing is not rote and repetition and ritual. It is remembering and recommitting. And I believe in that recommitment, we're recommitting our lives to Christ, who we surrendered to him as Lord, did we not? The Bible says that if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And so if you're born again, truly, genuinely, then there was a time you confessed Jesus as Lord. And this is a reminder to us that that decision has already been made. And we need to make sure that we're still re-upping on that that we shouldn't lose it, but when the cares of this world pulls us away, we come back to it. We come back to the fact that Jesus is Lord, and he earned that by dying on the cross for all of our sins and raising from the dead. And we see that in Philippians chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul says, Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the very form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation took upon him. The form of the servant was made in the likeness of man. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that what? Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, I believe, I preached a few weeks ago on the millennial reign of Christ. I believe that's pointing to that event when every knee of above earth, below the earth, and in the earth will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But wouldn't you agree the church of Jesus Christ needs to be confessing it right now? And that if we're really genuinely born again, we're going to be called to recommit to Jesus as Lord. I would add to that because I think sometimes people misinterpret what a commitment to Christ fully means. But I believe that that means you ought to be committed to your local church as well. That if you've committed your life to Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church, how can we not be committed to the church, which is the body and bride of Christ? Too many people today think that they're Worshiping a, a, a decapitated Savior. <laughs> and yet the Bible says that Christ is the head of the church, but the church is his body. And because we're composed of human beings, it's not perfect, but we do serve a perfect Lord. And we are to commit and join together and recommit ourselves to the purposes of the church, I believe, as we observe the Lord's Supper together. Those are the purposes of the Lord's Supper. Number three, the elements of the Lord's Supper.
What are we to use? Now, you know that if you go to different churches around, you're going to see different elements used. But first of all, we use unleavened bread. And notice that word unleavened. It's a scriptural word. It just simply means that the bread doesn't have yeast in it that makes it rise into a loaf. And so that's why those little things taste kind of like cracker-like, all right? They've not had yeast in it to make it rise. In addition, we observe the fruit of the vine. Now, in our church, this is grape juice. I believe that's exactly what the text says. It says fruit of the vine. Even if it had used the word oinos for wine, it doesn't necessarily mean intoxicating wine. But I, I believe if God didn't want the yeast in the bread, why would he want the yeast in the grape juice? Because it takes yeast in the grape juice that would ferment the grape juice into wine. And so here we take unleavened bread and we take unleavened grape juice when it comes to the elements. Now, big question are the elements of bread and juice when we consume them, are they still bread and juice or do they actually become the body and blood of Christ? That's a big debate that's not just going on in 2023. In the Middle Ages and in the Reformation, there was huge debate and there was huge argument about this. And there is one view, it's called tran substantiation. Notice that word tran, transformation. Think of that. Because this is the view of the Roman Catholic Church and others that at a moment in the service, the juice and the bread actually transforms into the body and blood of Jesus. Now there's a lot of doctrinal discussion like, well, why does it still taste like Wine. They would take wine, of course. Why does it still taste like the bread? And so that theologically is bantered around. Oh, it is, but it tastes differently. Well, if you tested it chemically, would it be bread? Oh, yeah, it would, but it is actually transformed into the body, blood of Christ, which I don't believe that's scripturally what we're being taught here. And I'll tell you why in just a, a moment. But I think there's a big theological thing behind that as well that we don't have time to get into because in that view, generally, generally the church believes that if you're not taking of the elements of communion or the Eucharist as most likely it would be called in that environment, then you could possibly not have your salvation later that this is tied in to keeping you saved. It's one of the sacraments of the church, transubstantiation. Another view that has come about over the years is a view, and I'm simplifying this, there's a lot of subsidiary views, but one is called consubstantiation. I believe the Lutheran denomination is one that would avert to this idea. And this is kind of a middle of the road. This is a view that, no, it's, it's bread, and it, it's wine, but the presence of the Lord is there spiritually with it. But it is the real presence of God because the word con in Latin means with. So con means God is with the elements. That's the second view, kind of an intermediary view. And then there's the third view that our church and most churches like ours are going to embrace. And that is the symbolic view. And that is the view that the elements of the Lord's Supper were and are and will continue to be juice and bread. But they represent the body and blood of Christ. Now, why do we teach that? Luke twenty-two nineteen, 19, when Jesus said, And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. And when he took the juice and said, this is my blood, here's the question. Where at that moment was his body and his blood? It was standing right before them, right? He had not yet even been sacrificed. And I think absolutely clearly Jesus is using metaphors here, which he did throughout of his ministry. And when he says, do this by consuming of me literally, no, he says, do it in 
remembrance. There we go. That's the word we get, memorial, memorial. This is a memorial view of the Lord's Supper, that we're doing it as a memorial to Christ in remembrance of Christ because what, what is not important is the elements. Now, they have a role to play, okay? They, I, I, I'm not comfortable going out and getting Pepsi-Cola and, you know, a loaf of bread. Now, if you are on a desert island and that's all you had, I guess you got to use what you've got. But we want to get as close as we can to keep the symbolism but the fact of the matter is what, what is not important is the element so much as our Lord and our commitment to the Lord. That's what's important. And that's what we're doing when it comes to the elements of the Lord's Supper. Now that brings us to number four, and I know I'm running pretty quickly here, uh, but I want to get to the last one. Number four is the regularity of the Lord's Supper. You will have people say, man, you need to be doing it every week. Some you need to do it annually, some do it quarterly. We generally do it about every two months, six times a year. And why do we do it that way? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Paul says this, in the same way he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, as often as you do it, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You see, that's the only thing that we have, as far as I know, that gives us the regularity of how often that we do it. And so I believe there's some flexibility here. That's why most Baptist churches are not going to feel that you're wrong if you don't do it exactly the same time period as another church does it? You know why? Because we want to do it regularly enough that we need to come back to remember Christ and recommit to him. But we don't want the Lord's Supper to become rote and repetition and ritual and have the temptation for it to become devoid of its original meaning and just become a fixture in the church when it comes to doing it. So there's flexibility. I want you to know that. And I'm not preaching against any other church based upon their regularity. But I believe that we get to pick what works best and what we feel like works uh, for our church. And that brings us finally, number five, is preparation. Preparation for the Lord's Supper. How do we get ready? Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 and 20 tell us this. This is the great commission. The commission that Jesus gave right before he ascended in the heaven. So he's already died on the cross. He's rose from the dead. He's walked this earth for 40 days. And now he has ascended into heaven. And he gives this great commission to his disciples. And he says, go to all the world and make disciples of all nations. There's the first command. Go and make disciples. Make disciples. Number two, he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then number three, the third command he gives the church is to teach them to observe everything I have commanded you. Go and make disciples, baptize them, teach them. By the way, that's the cliff notes of what we're about as a church. We try to organize everything we do around those three things because that's the marching orders of Jesus for the church. So the question we have to ask is where does the Lord's Supper fit into those three things? Make disciples baptize them, teach them. Is it making disciples? No, in fact, I've discussed that a little bit, but we, we would have a whole lot more to say about the fact that the Lord's Supper does not save you. It, it, it's not what saves you. you. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is God's gift, not of works. So it's not making disciples. Well, is it baptizing disciples? No, no that's the other ordinance. We're supposed to do that. We've got to do that. And it's important that we do it. And by the way, if you're saved, why aren't you willing to get baptized the way Jesus did? That's number two. Well, is it teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you? There it is right there. It's a part of that. It's not all of that. We have Bible classes. We teach through the Bible in our worship service. Everything we're about is trying to grow people in their relationship with Christ and their understanding of Scripture. And a part of that, I believe, is the Lord's Supper. So here's the thing. 
Before you get to step three, you got to go through one and two. And the question I'd ask, number one, is are you saved? Do you know that you know that you know that you've surrendered your life completely and totally to Jesus Christ? That's step number one. You're really not a candidate to take of the Lord's Supper rightly till you've been saved, till you've received him in your life. Number two is baptism. I believe you need to be baptized the way Jesus was. Now, a lot of people have different traditions as it relates to their background. But simply put, when Jesus and John the Baptist climbed into the Jordan River and John baptized him, the word baptizo means to immerse. That's literally what it means. He stuck him all the way under, came out thus Being the example for us, Jesus didn't have to be saved or baptized. He was being the example for you and me. But picturing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, you need to do that. You need to do that so that you can then do all that's involved in step number three. It's not just the Lord's Supper. It's membership in the church. It's getting a ministry in the church and serving in the church. There's so many more things that go with that. So, have you been saved Have you been baptized and are you willing to grow in your faith? Now that brings us to the final and last thing and we'll be through for our invitation. And this is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 27 through 29. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. Notice this, the Apostle Paul speaking. There's a way to do this in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. There we go. You've got to examine yourself. You know why? Because I don't know your heart. Only God knows your heart perfectly. We each need to ask the Lord about wisdom concerning our own heart. In this way, then, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Number three, complete repentance of all sin. Complete repentance of all sin. Now here's, you might say, see, what is that about the judgment? Let me tell you what I think that believes, that means. You're going to hear, there's different interpretations of it. But here's what I think that means. And I think it's happening all over the world. I believe that when a person takes the Lord's Supper lightly because they've maybe never trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Maybe they're unwilling to get scripturally baptized. They're in one way or another living in unrepentance. Maybe they're a believer, but they're, 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 living, they're, they're backsliding. But especially for the unbeliever. They go to a church and in their minds... They say, this is what we do. This is the ritual of being a part of this church. So let me just take the elements and do it like everyone else does it. And taking that lightly, let me tell you what happens. When the Lord's Supper is to remind us of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus so that we can apply that truth and be saved for all of eternity, but a person doesn't apply that, they simply take it in a flippant and unworthy manner, then what happens, I believe, is they wipe a callousness on their heart. And then the next time they do it, their heart gets a little harder and a little harder and a little harder. And eventually, not just the Lord's Supper, but almost anything that the church of Jesus Christ does to call a person to repentance, that person can't hear any longer. And in so doing, it's sealing up more and more judgment Because one day, everyone's going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Either in the great white throne of judgment for the unbelievers or the judgment seat of Christ. And I believe it's there that we're going to come face to face with the decisions we've made and how we've lived. And so here's what I would say to you. If you observe the Lord's Supper as we're doing this, but you take a flippant attitude about it. No big deal. I'm just going to do it and move on. Listen, listen. You're playing games with your eternity, okay? Examine yourself. Examine yourself. The scripture tells us in Psalm 139, 23 and 24, and I believe this should be our prayer. Search me, O God, and know me. 
Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any ungodliness, any wickedness in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. And so we're going to pray. And I hope that that's the prayer of our heart. Would you bow with me right now? Lord Jesus, as we enter our time of invitation, Lord, I pray that you will help us, Lord, to examine ourselves, see where we stand before you. Lord, I pray there'd be nobody here that leaves being deceived by the enemy because, Lord, we know that heaven and hell are at stake. We know what you taught us on this earth was that...